I know all of us should take away from just your comments there to look at. Where are we in this journey? Have we really thought about the things that we don't want to think about? Mm -hmm. And uh, have we gotten our house in order? And from this perspective, it's more of the spiritual house. You know, Jim talked about the financial house. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about the community house. Jean Marie talked about some of the things that she's experiencing and the houses she has to put back together for caregivers and survivors. And Michelle talked about the whole survivor getting your house in order of how you're going to live through it. Mm -hmm. So every one of these steps are things that get us closer to say, what really is it that we need to put in order? And how do we address that? Mm -hmm. Tell us, Roger, when you first hear people come to you when they've just been diagnosed with cancer, whether it's a recurrence or for the very first time, what are, the, what are some of their challenges or what are some of their perspectives that, that maybe they're coming for you for answers mm -hmm. or they're just giving you the news, but how do you respond to that? Well, how I respond to it is... Uh First of all, I just want to listen because I think there's, there's waves, and you've probably talked about some of this. There's different waves of how that, how that fear and that grief comes into a person's life. But pastorally, I think what I face most often is that people come with a question that says, why? They're often coming to me saying, Pastor, you've studied the Bible all your life, and you've given all these sermons about faith and victory and overcoming and and so here I am I've got this positive test that just came back and I want to know why what's God trying to say to me and that's an impossible question for me to answer usually and the reason is because whether we whether we know it or not we're all philosophers and we're all trying to solve the problem of evil why do bad things happen to good people why did this happen to me? And what I find many people with cancer asking is, why me? Why now? Why this? And, and uh, you know, have I done something? Or is God trying to say something to me? And it would be presumptuous of me to try to scan their life and say, yeah, here's the reason. You know, here's the moral reason. Here's the spiritual reason. Uh, they may know something. There may be some behavior associated with it, but normally there isn't. They, but they want to know why. And I think that's the hardest thing to get away from. And so I would like to encourage people to no longer ask that question. Not that it isn't important. It's certainly important in a philosophical, theological framework. We need to know where evil and sickness and death come from. And, and the Bible has an answer for that. It's one that many people don't like, but it cannot be contravened. And that is that the whole world is fallen, and this is the place of the dying, and there's another place that's the land of the living. It's not here. That's a big story. I won't go into it. But asking the question why is usually a sinkhole that leads to an almost obsessive, compulsive investigation as to if I knew more about why this happened and the the chemistry of it or the, the DNA of it or my own behavior of it, if I knew why I had this cancer, that would solve it for me. That would give me a reason for it. But it never does. Information, as all of you patients know, just makes us more fearful. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't seek it, because a lot of times that information will extend our life. It will help us understand some of the things we need to know. But I would like to suggest three other questions. And I try to walk people through these questions, but they're recurring. They don't just happen by saying, oh, yeah, I'll just change my mind. <laughs> but instead of asking why, I encourage people to, to ask the question, what? By asking what, I'm saying, what has happened to me? Let me describe what it is. Can I name it? Can I name what I have, what I'm facing, what's the situation I'm in? In other words, it's a walk around the scene of the accident and taking assessment there. Uh, and that sounds kind of unfeeling, but unless we know what it means, including our prognosis, then we really can't proceed. The second question is, who? Who is available to help me? 
And, and many times my conversation goes like this with people. And they'll say, well, they'll say, I don't know what to do next. And I will say, well, who do you know that has a similar experience? Or who do you know that holds some wisdom for you or knowledge for you or medical potential for you? Who do you know? Start contacting those people. And since I'm primarily dealing, dealing with the spiritual and emotional side of that, it's usually contacting the who who can be an encouragement, somebody who has a similar experience, getting people in the same room who, when they say, I understand, they really understand. So instead of asking why, we ask, we ask what, what's my condition, who can help me, and the third question is, how do I take the next step? And that usually comes down to this. Is there something I know I need to do today? Or is there information that I lack that I could go discover? Well, I, I call it doing the next right thing. And it's amazing to me how, how we learn and how the horizon extends itself as we ask those questions. But when we ask why, we get in this vortex of examination and almost self-consumption that can lead to a it can lead to a kind of a self-pitying sort of puddle. And um, so that, that's, a, that's typical. But mm -hmm. it, it, and I, when I say this, I don't say it in an unfeeling way. I, I just say it as I've observed in hundreds of ways. We're not going to solve the problem of evil why this gene landed on me when I was 51 years old. We're never going to solve that. And, if, and to try to do that, uh, dissipates our energy for, for the life that we have today. I think you touched on a real important point that so often, and I think it's, I don't know if it's just American, but we're always looking for the answer so we could fix something. Yeah. And I remember one of the biggest frustrations I had going through cancer was people didn't really want to listen to me, they just wanted to fix me. And I didn't want him to fix me. It was just, you know, hear me out. I don't know if I'm ranting. I don't know if I'm sharing good information. I don't know if I'm spiritually sound, but I'm really not looking to be fixed because at that moment, there could be 20 or 30 options. Yeah. So what you're saying is so true because that why question really creates all these hypothetical situations or hypotheses of, well, did I understand this one? Could it be this? Could it be that? Instead of living for the day to say, well, it doesn't matter what the reason is. It is what it is right now. Well, it also implies in many people a view of God that is punitive. Yeah. That God only intersects my life when he wants to punch me and get me to pay attention. And that's my, that must be what this is. Now, certainly we will learn things about God and about ourselves, about our own sins and failures in this condition, but I say it's presumptuous of me to be able to look at you, for example, and say, I know why this is happening, John, because I don't have that wisdom. And it, that, that's a, I think it's a terrible spiritual abuse for people to say, well, I know why you're going through this. If you just straighten that out, then God would take his thumb off of you and you'd be perfectly healthy again. So I think that's implied. There's some toxic spirituality in that, and I will say this: If you're not a a, a Christ follower, uh, I'll let you in on a little secret. I find this question "Why" being asked with more passion by dedicated Christians, yeah. because for some reason we think that's the deeper question that we should ask, and if we could solve that little nut, then everything else would make sense. So it's almost as if we are. We're fighting against reality, thinking that we're more spiritual to ask that question, when really we should be asking the what and the who and the how question. But, I, I, but also, you don't need me for this either. You need what, 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 John, what Jake is talking about. And that's, to me, a great joy, is if I can say, you know what, I have a friend who would really understand can I call him or can I call her? And the two of you can go have a cup of coffee. Yeah. You know, the, getting people in the presence of somebody who really will listen 
is, is medicine. Now, we've talked a lot about the cancer patient, cancer survivor. Mm-hmm. How about the caregiver? You know, the family member, that person, the neighbor, mm-hmm. the friend, the support group. I found in my own life that the, t- and the caregiver really is the noble servant mm. that sacrifices the most because their lives change mm-hmm. and they don't have any control over any of it. Yeah. So how do you uh, encourage the caregivers? Well, I probably don't do a very good job of that while they're giving the care, partly because I'm not involved in their life. I see it. Um, I guess I have to confess, I, I probably wouldn't be a very good caregiver, so <laughs> don't tell my wife that. <laughs> I mean, it's just not, not naturally a part of me. I'm, I'm sure I would learn. Anyway, too much information. Sorry. Uh, but I do meet people at the, at the memorial service and afterwards. And what I find in many caregivers is a lot of guilt. And, um, and often it's because the caregiver is so uh, enmeshed in the person and the health and the welfare of the cancer sufferer that, that they've really taken on that identity. And, of course, they're, they're, they love the person and they've <coughs> tried and they've hurled themselves into this vortex of, of impending death and they've, they've fought it and they've been the encourager and they've said, no, we're not going to give up and they've been the cheerleader and the bedpan carrier and the pill counter and they've just done it all. And there's tremendous loss, not only losing the person that they love, who they may, they may be confident is in the presence of God and in a very good place, but they're still not here. So Life changes. It's everything changes uh, about their life. But one of the things that that I I think that um, I can help them with not not me but I think this truth helps is that we are people who are caught in a sequence. We live in a sequential world. We can never see the future and we can never go back. We only have this moment. And what I find is that that a lot of this guilt is a false kind of guilt, and it's the kind of guilt that says, if only I had, you know, if if only I had done this last week, or if only I had been there, if only I had said that. And many times these caregivers are there all through this. They're there up until the last moment. They've been there and literally held the person in their arms as they breathe their last breath. But they still feel like, if I had only done this one other thing, or a week later after the memorial service, they might think, oh, I never said that. I never said that. I should have said that. And it's this if only kind of thing. And I think we need to assure the caregiver, you are, who are caregivers, you can only work in the sequence that you're in. You can only do what you can do in a moment, in a day. And there will always be this regret. I think it's a, a, sometimes a harsh regret we place on ourselves, but there will always be this regret that if only I had said this or if only I had done that, then, then the, the person I love would have known that better or uh, I, would have, I would have felt better about it. So it's kind of a survivor, a survivor guilt. Now, while the, while the cancer survivor is still living, what I find is, and many of you could speak to this much more eloquently than me, I just find a, a sheer exhaustion. And the, the need for somebody to say, you know, there's a reason why they tell you on the airplane to put your oxygen mask on first. Because if you don't, you'll black out and you can't help anybody else. And, and self-care for the caregiver is another whole subject. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that will be addressed. But somebody needs to be giving permission, in fact, enforcing it that you need time away. You've got to get out of the house. You need to get away from this. You need to do some things, and that's not a bad thing. For you to have some life, some enjoyment, some freedom is refreshment for you to come back. And, 
and everybody who's in the helping professions, pastors, counselors, nurses, doctors, psychologists, everybody's in the, in the helping professions knows that we have a professional weakness, and that is that we don't care for ourselves. Well, it's times 10 for a cancer caregiver because you're right there uh, all the time, and there is no distance, there's no separation. So that's more than I know. That's an excellent answer. <laughs> <laughs> now it's your chance. Do you have any questions to, for Pastor Roger about the topic that we're talking about now as far as dying well? Is this a safe place to tell a bad joke? Maybe not. Yeah, well, uh, when, when somebody said you're going to talk about ending well, there's an old joke. The guy says, I want to die, I want to die peacefully in my sleep like my uncle. Not like the passengers in his car who were screaming in panic. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's actually not that bad of a joke. <laughs> 